She was identified via fingerprints, um, but her, I mean, I'm the person who found Maricela. Um, and so- You found her? I found her. Wow. Um, she was identified, her body was in bad, was in a, was in a bad state of um, decomp. Um, they were able to get fingerprints to match to, her family had filed a missing persons report, um, but her body was so decomposed that they had to um, remove her hands and then, and then put them in saline solution so they could rehydrate them and then to take, the, to take the, the fingerprints. Oh my gosh. Here's one story about Maricela and about her family and about all the people that have been um, deeply impacted by her death. That's just one of person. the takes. Yeah. Of the, one the, human. You know, you know, one human. So you amplify that story 3,000 times. Um, you know, it's a lot of it's a lot of sorrow, um, especially for the orange tags. I mean, there's there's over a thousand people in Arizona that um, have disappeared. Basically, the families will, will never probably find out what happened to them. And um, you know that's this horrible um, aspect to it. The desert is used as a, as a way to deter migrants, and it kills them, and then it destroys their bodies. The goal of this project, I mean, it is it's participatory. So these tags on this wall were filled out by about 500 volunteers at the University of Pennsylvania um, several months ago. And so with every exhibition that we're doing in 150 locations on five continents next year, we send them the kits with the basics and the information, and then they have to mobilize their communities to fill out the tow tags. And so for us, the most important aspect of the, of, the, of the whole thing is the filling out of the tags, and that kind of moment of solidarity with, with migrants and then, and then mounting it on the wall. Um, so that, that for us is, a, you know, so it's not just coming and looking at the tow tags, yes. but, it's, but it's what does it mean to write down someone's name and, and the date they were found and the condition they were found in. Is that a way to raise our awareness and, and yeah. to connect us more to that issue? someone's opinion may contradict yours. Where's my friend Alan? It's all about your perspective. Who are we and what is the nature of this reality? What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. We are still on site at the American Anthropological Association's annual meeting in Vancouver, British Columbia, for our second partnership with them. We are now going to be talking with, for our second interview, Dr. Jason De Leon. Yeah. Hi, Jason. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks for coming back yeah. on. Yeah. Congrats on all the progress. Look at this. Thanks. The beautiful project is now officially behind us. The Undocumented Migration Project, Hostile Terrain 94. And this is now on tour across the United States and internationally, which is it, huge. It will be. Yeah. Yes. It's, it's, yeah. Yes. And I'm so pumped to break this down with you um, and to unpack getting behind some of the a tag represents actual human being and we got it we're gonna get into that sure. um, to start Jason we've been fascinated with these questions and I'm really excited to hear your perspective about them are we really all one mm. you know I think as an anthropologist that's the argument that we've we're always trying to make is that um, whatever differences we might see between people they're all you know superficial and we all have a common ancestor we all come from Africa um, and it's, uh, it's kind of our job to, to really, I think, share that information with the public so people understand that, yes, we are, in fact, all, all one. We're, one you know, we're, we're all the same species, and anything, these divisions that we have are culturally constructed divisions. Um, so when, when you get down to it, the root of it, you know, of course, we're, we're, we're all one. I love it. And it's been great actually being at the Anthropological Association's annual meeting because we've been talking about it from a perspective of, yeah, the human species is all one. But then, as we've been talking about it on the show so frequently, we also look at whatever you want to call it, the Big Bang or Source or God or Creation. I don't really care what you want to call it, but since that 13.8 billion years ago moment until now and four and a half billion years ago, all of the species, the 100 million species that have evolved on the planet up until now, those are also all one because it all goes back to a single source. Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I think part of the anthropological endeavor is to help us understand our place in the world. 
um, our, how we interact with, with one another, how we interact with our environment, and understanding that you know, humans don't live in a vacuum. Even if people want to pretend that they do, uh, we know that everything that we do is deeply connected to, to nature, to the environment, and we're in this current, current moment where people really need to understand that um, but this relationship between, between us and everybody else on the planet is a very fragile one. And um, if we don't take care of the planet, we don't take care of ourselves, um, you know, the, the end is unfortunately in, in sight. And this leads us to the next point, as you said, everything is so deeply interconnected. The air that we're breathing in right now is coming from phytoplankton and trees. The bite of food that you just had brought prior to this was nourishing you through the power of the sun and the soil. Mm. That these systems are so deeply, intricately connected that there is no separation. No. And do you think that that is the most upstream issue that we face? Um, I think it's a big one. I mean, I think um, climate change uh, and, you know, human-induced climate change, I think, is, a, is one of the most crucial um, issues of our time. And it connects to all these other issues that people don't necessarily want to see the connections between. So, you know, climate change forces people to leave their homes because they can't, they can't it's not sustainable in, in certain places. Um, and so we have a global migration crisis that's happening now that's partly the result of, you know, the way in which we've interacted with the environment over the last um, several hundred years. Um, but but, but I, I do think you can make that argument that um, that our relationship to the planet right now is the, is the most crucial issue that we're, that we're dealing with. Yeah, and it seems as though the more enlightened we are about the true interconnectedness and there being no separation, the less climate issues we have, the less mental health crisis issues we have, the less inequality we have, the more we try and build a social fabric that's conducive to the flourishing of every single one of the humans mm -hmm. that is here. So it feels like that is the most upstream that is then solving, that could then solve so many of the downstream ones. The, one of the big questions is, well, how do we catalyze those feelings sure. of interconnectedness or enlightenment sure. or unconditional love? Yeah, it's tough. I mean, how do you convince people to be self-aware? Um, you know, you hope as, as an educator that you can do that. You hope that through research um, and the dissemination of knowledge that people can have a better understanding of their, of their place in the world. Um, but I don't know, it feels like right now we're, we're kind of in um, dark times or, you know, this kind of post-truth moment where people don't necessarily want to hear things that are, that are unpleasant or that fly in the face of, of maybe what they, what they think they, they know about the world. Um, so it's tough. I mean, getting people to, to wake up and, and see the writing on the wall is one of our biggest challenges right now, and I think an an anthropologists are are struggling to to show the general public that look, uh, we need to understand what's going on, our relationships with with the environment, with with one another, and um, I think social scientists and I think anthropologists in general are really um, well positioned to to talk about the human condition, but we got to figure out how to do it better so that people really can can understand it and um, and, and pick up on it. Yes. This is the huge point that you make. AAA in anthropology in general is such a multidisciplinary study, and we adore that. And we here on the program are huge synthesis. We try and synthesize science, spirituality, all these complex fields into some sort of a story that inspires people to take action, that inspires awakening. Yeah. So anthropologists also have that as one of their most pressing issues, is figuring out how to tell the stories in new age multimedia content style ways yeah. that then get people inspired to actually understanding the yeah. world that we're in. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I think we're in a moment too where anthropologists are, under, are, are starting to realize that the traditional ways in which we've tried to disseminate knowledge aren't accessible to a lot of people. You know, the, the journal article, the academic manuscript, most of the world has, has wants nothing to do with those things. And we need to be more, more savvy. We need to be um, better at translating our work for a general public. And whether that's through film, through social media, through art, uh, I think all of those things should be um, should be explored within the discipline. And it does feel like right now we're in a moment where people are starting to really recognize the, the importance of that, of that type of work. Um, and I know for me, like on a, on a personal level, I've seen the power that comes with, with making your work accessible and, and translating it for, for different kinds of audiences. And um, you know, I'm firmly committed 
to um, you know to ex exploring those uh, uh, those issues and really trying to be an example for others in the discipline that you know that anthropology doesn't have to look one kind of way you can do a whole bunch of different things I mean for us, like, this, this exhibition is a um, case in point um, exactly we'll reach more people with this exhibition than I'll ever reach with with a book or with a, a journal article yeah so. and being able to come further compress yes this exhibition going on around the world extremely awakening and also taking things like even this exhibition and further compressing it into a, a, a short, you know, short video about yeah. you, yeah, yeah, powerfully speaking about the reason why this even exists and putting that across, you know, TikTok and Snapchat, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, going really crazy on, yeah, yeah. on getting to Gen Z, yep. uh, yeah, yeah, and awaken them. So, I mean, the mediums, it's so important. The medium becomes the message. Yeah. Um, is it then that this complexity that we're talking about of the current state of our reality and the trajectory of where we're going and how we awaken, is that the reason why this was even made in the first place for us to rise to these challenges? Um, what, do you, which, what do you mean by the, in the first place? Like our reality in general or? Yeah, was this reality mm -hmm. made so that we could experience this adventure in consciousness where we have this complex reality that we have to deal with to try and progress? You know, that's a good question. Um, I think as a, as a not very spiritual person, um, I'm probably not, not the best person to kind of ask that question to. Um, but I do think, you know, we as a species are, um, you know, we're constantly responding to our environment, and our environment's change. I mean, evolution is a um, is happening in, in real time, and so it's 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 really fascinating to kind of look and, and you know how our species responding to to changes to history, um, and I think you know at least in the in the kind of human sense, our our, our awareness of the world um, has really has changed, has evolved over time, and I think that we're a lot smarter than we used to be in, in some ways, and then maybe dumber in others. Yes, um, but. Uh, I, I do think these kind of existential questions are really um, important and ones that, that everybody's kind of gra you know, grappling with. You know, what is, the, what is the meaning of all this? Yes. Where are we headed? Yes. Um, you know, is life about suffering? Is it about overcoming suffering? Or, yes, or is, yes. it about, is it about some, something else? Um, Every so. child being equipped with that question and probing mm -hmm. into their reality with that is yeah. such a fundamental For sure. beginning For sure. point. Okay, and now we have this more than ever, we have uh, what we think are two really interesting ways to look at dichotomy in a sense. You have indigeneity, which has a deep interconnectedness to each other, to nature. You have modernity, which has incredible advances in technology, sure. but some lack in interconnectedness and lack in uh, to yeah. nature and to each other. Is, is a good idea a marriage. Sure. No, I mean, I think just any kind of sensitivity to, to the many issues at play, whether, that, whether you want to call that, you know, um, traditional knowledge um, or, or something else, I, I think you, the technology has gotten so far away from us and we've lost sight of, I think, some really crucial kind of elements of what it means to be human. And so I, I, don't, think, I don't think you can have this, these advances in technology without really addressing these other kinds of issues. I mean, and when we do do that, we know that it, it, it you know, it's not gonna um, end well for us. Uh, so I think that, and I, I, I think we're in a moment too where, um, where people are recognizing that. I mean, as, as we see the technology now happening at, at a speed that is almost incomprehensible, um, we're all struggling to kind of catch up. And um, I do feel like there's hope in people thinking about, um, you know, how do we best equip ourselves for, for dealing with the future and for dealing with you know this runaway technology how do we how do we pull it back or um, make sure that it's developing in a, in a, in a, in a sensitive you know ethical kind of way um, yeah it's a if we continue making technology without being morally ethically spiritually philosophically literate and advanced we're going to cause greater suffering than if we would just do those first principle sure. practices for sure yeah it could, new technologies like you said it's incomprehensible they're being they're being emerging technologies and markets are being created meanwhile the fruits are going to the top 1% 50% of the new wealth is going to 1% this is this is 
ripping apart our social fabric. Yeah half of the planet is still on $2.50 a day or less, mm. which is what we pay here for a cup of coffee. Yeah. These are very important things to structure the new architectures that make it so the democratization of the fruits go out to us all. And think about all the gifts that get unleashed. The median yeah. age of Africa is 18 right now. Yeah. All of the unique hearts and gifts that get to express themselves if we can m stitch together that proper social fabric. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah no, it's a, I mean, Technology is another huge issue that we have to deal with. And um, I think anthropology has been very good at making predictions and, and trying to make us aware of what, you know, the repercussions of what we're doing. And I think, and, and you know, thinking into the future in terms of, you know, what we do today, how's it going to look in 50 years, but then also trying to use things like archaeology to teach us these important history lessons, to remind yes. us, like, these things have gone, have gone bad in the past. And so um, we need to pay attention to, you know, to our, our own histories so that we don't make these same mistakes again. This is a perfect segue. I believe last year, around the same time when we did our first interview, you really expanded my consciousness to a new dimension of awareness. You taught me that contemporary archaeology can be something like studying the US-Mexico border and these border crossings that have been happening and these humans, for a myriad of different reasons, are pursuing a, in, in many ways, leaving something that is less around their flourishing and trying to get to something that's more sure. for their flourishing. Sure, sure. And it, it's, it's so incredible that, that this can even be done around the, around the world where there is a new chapter in what archaeology can be when it's done. And there's, this is happening all around the world. We were talking about all these different border conflicts last time as well that are happening around the world and how we can try and, if it's safe, sure. if it's safe, mm -hmm. we can go and try and be contemporary archaeologists to create things like this so that it doesn't just get swept under the rug in history sure, sure. and everything blown away. Because if you, you know, if you begin trying to process this, this is 3,200 over 20 years something like that or yeah. so yep. wow of going in and doing field work where I mean you have to imagine this because some of these tags we're gonna read them they say things uh, like the body still has flesh yep. or the body does not have flesh so yep. you literally saw this yep. humans that yep. are in those positions sure and and you have to have the ability to log that yeah. and to understand, like, have enough humanity to like try and. This is such a emotionally stressing process as yeah. well because he's yeah yeah <sighs> yeah. It's a heavy it's a heavy thing, um, but you know it's it's trying to remind people or raise awareness. I mean, many people don't don't know this thing is going on, and so I think part of my job as an anthropologist is to disseminate knowledge about the world so people can understand, hey, we've been having a humanitarian crisis at the U.S.-Mexico border for a long time and it's taken thousands of people's lives and it continues to do so right, you know, right now. Yeah. Um, and so how do we raise, raise that, 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 that awareness? Um, it's, again, it's just so nuts thinking about you and other uh, members of your team going into the field yeah. and going through this, like you said, heavy process of identifying things like humans yeah. that have passed, that across 20 years you've you found 3,200, but there's oh, like but not me, not me though. You so, teams, so th this, teams, but this this info this info comes from the um, Pima County Office of the Medical Examiner, and so I mean we we have found human remains, but but many most of these are you know found by other hikers, um, law enforcement. Wow. Um, you know, hunters, that kind of stuff, or migrants who call the police and say, you know, someone disappeared. And, they, and so it's a, 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 a wide range of, of, of um, circumstances in which these bodies were found. Hikers, law officers, uh, Pima, you said Pima County. Pima County, yeah. In what, what state? In, in Arizona. In Arizona, Pima yeah. County, Arizona. A majority of this is the Arizona so this is our, this is Arizona, Mexico. Yeah. Oh, only Arizona, Mexico is yep. here. Yep, yep. Okay. So if you were to expand this into California or into Texas, New Mexico, you know, you would add a lot more a lot more bodies. That's one of the four 
no. states yep. that's on the border. Yep. Okay, so one out of four states has 3,200 so far identified sure. tags. In re 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 recovered, so the orange are unidentified bodies. And the manila represent people who have names. So there's about 1,200 unidentified bodies that have just been um, buried in a pauper's grave. Wow. Okay, tw there's 1,200 orange tags. Yeah. And those are unidentified. Yep. Wow. Okay. Let's do this. Let's let's take one. I'll re I'll remember where it's coming from. No, no, it's fine. It's going to come down in a minute. So, so this is an unidentified tag, and this is again. This is so. This is a human that was discovered, um, but unidentifiable. Yeah. Yeah. And it could be because they they themselves that the body condition. Yeah. One of the items on the tag says decompose. Yeah. So then you can't actually identify facial features. No. Yeah. So if it's like skeletal remains, you know, there's no way to do fingerprints. Um, you can do a DNA sample, but it doesn't necessarily, you can take a DNA sample, but if you don't have a comparative sample, um, you know, to match it to, then it's not gonna, it's not gonna do you any good. So you can extract DNA from, from skeletal remains, do a DNA analysis, but if someone hasn't submitted that person's DNA or a relative, you're not gonna you're not gonna have anything to match it to. So, and people don't know that their relatives are that they're dead. They don't know where they, or if, if they if they've disappeared. They may not know where they disappeared. Maybe they disappeared in Mexico or in, in California. You know, people just don't know. So. Oh my goodness. Okay. So, wow. So there's this breakdown of um, unidentified and identified, and seeing a decomposed body and not being able to know even who the sure. human is yeah. what who what their what their name was what their family was what their unique gift that they were could have brought to the world is yeah. ambitions were friends were yeah so that is that is unidentified now we will go with identified well here how about this one yeah Okay, so this is an identified, and there's then there's about two thousand identified. identified. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and so we're looking at a female that was around the age of thirty. Yep. Her name was Carmita Maricela Zaguipuya. Carmita Maricela Zaguipuya. Yeah. And now, how did you even gain the name? Did they have identification? She was identified via fingerprints. Um, but her, I mean, I'm the person who found Maricela. Um, and so you found her. I found her. Wow. Um, she was identified. Her body was in bad, was in a, was in a bad state of, um, decomp. Um, they were able to get fingerprints to match to her family had filed a missing persons report. Um, but her body was so decomposed that they had to, um, remove her hands and then, and then put them in saline solution so they could rehydrate them then to take the, to take the, the fingerprints. Oh my gosh. <sighs> wow, okay. Um, she was from Ecuador. She was a mother of three. An Equ uh, and you learned that information as well when you, with the family. You I went to ties. Ecuador. I went to Ecuador to meet with her family. You um, did. I've met with her wow. family in New York. Um, and she's kind of a big inspiration for this project. Um, I spent a lot of time writing about her family and about the impact that her death had on, on, her, on her kids. Oh my goodness, so you went to Ecuador, met with her family, also in New York. Yeah. Um, so, what was the reason why she had left? You know, her family was, was poor. Um, they were living in a, like, one room dirt shack with a dirt floor. Um, and, you know, the, she said to her family, you know, my kids are starving here, and so I've gotta go and try to find s some way to support them. Um, and then one of the last things she said to them was, you know, my, my, my kids are dying of hunger here, and so I cannot just sit idly by as it happens. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna migrate, um, and whatever my fate is, at least I've tried, you know, I've, I've tried to improve, the, improve their lives. Wow. Wow. And this is, this is, uh, how, many, how many children again? Three. Three, three kids, 
trying to provide them with a better life. Yeah. Maricela. Wow. Ecuadorian. Yep. And just even to identify her, the hands needed to go in saline solution to get yeah. a fingerprint to yeah. confirm it. I mean, she'd only been dead maybe three or four days when we found her. But then she laid in, she was in cold storage, unembalmed for like three weeks. And so by the time the, the body was returned, I mean, she was in, it was in really bad condition. And one of the things that her family, I mean, her family was told not to open the coffin. Um, and so the body's not, it's not in a good shape. You don't, you really shouldn't see that. And, but of course, everybody wanted to see, to yeah. see her. The kids wanted to say goodbye. Yeah. Um, so they opened the coffin and it was incredibly traumatizing you know, for the family. situation this is yeah this is all wow the, I mean the body itself yeah I mean wow so the, yeah the body itself has a, a storage process so that it doesn't further um, decompose there's the family that wants to see the body yeah. that um, can get traumatized triggered by seeing yeah. it but wants to say goodbye yeah. the best solution is to not have this happening yeah yes and the Cause of, cause of death uh -huh. is COD and probable hypothermia. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. She probably died from a combination of hyperthermia and a, a pre existing um, kidney condition that she was left behind by her group um, and died by herself. Um, and probably because she just couldn't, she couldn't walk anymore because of her, both, both because of the heat and because of her, this medical problem that she was having. This is such a heavy. This is, this is so heavy. Oh. This is it is it's ridiculously heavy. And what do we what do we do? We have uh, people that want to feed their children, that want to um, gain greater economic opportunity to do so. Um, what is the way to make it so that this problem is not no. continuing? You know, I think we got to work on comprehensive immigration reform. You know, people need to migrate. We want the labor, so we should make we should make their ability to, to move between countries safer. Um, but also, I think we need to invest in these places. I mean, people don't want to migrate. I mean, they would prefer to stay home. And the way global inequality works is that there are many countries that are, um, you know, being abused by by powerful nations, and we like keeping them underdeveloped. Um, they provide us with a cheap source of labor. Um, we're able to exploit them in all kinds of ways. And so I think it's, it's not just immigration reform and allowing this, this kind of free movement of people, but also um, investing in infrastructure in these places so that people don't have to move. Um, I, think that's, I think you can't have one without the other. So following a, a power law distribution where there's only a couple economic powers that have a vast majority of the global wealth, they get to bully around other countries in the world um, and not necessarily focus on uplifting the other uh, countries in the world, but just reshaping rules and regulations for their own favor in the absolute worst case scenario that that's what, that's yep. what happens. And so it's both a process of actually truly finding the best means for investing into those regions to enable people to not need to make these migrations, but also create reformed migration to make it so that uh, people that are seeking to migrate can do so without the possibility of die, death yeah. in the yeah. process. Those are the two. Yeah. 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 I still can't believe that this is only one of four states. So you think that the number could be in 10,000? 10, 10, oh, yeah, yeah, probably. I mean, Texas, there's thousands of people who died in Texas, and we know very little about what's going on there. Arizona, I mean, uh, New Mexico is increasingly becoming a, a, a new crossing corridor. People are dying there now. You know, and I think about with this stuff, like, here's one story about Maricela and about her family and about all the people that have been um, deeply impacted by her death. That's just one of person. the tanks. Yeah, 
of the, one the, human, you know, one human. So you amplify that story three thousand times. Um, you know, it's a lot of it's a lot of sorrow, um, especially for the orange tags. I mean, there's there's over a thousand people in Arizona that um, have disappeared. Basically, the families will, will never probably find out what happened to them, and um, you know that's this horrible um, aspect to it. The desert is used as a, as a way to deter migrants, and it kills them, and then it destroys their bodies. And I think you know. People will say, well, you know, at least like with Maricela, we, we got her body back. We were able to bury her. We know where she is now. But, you know, I work with families that they, they've had family members disappear and they, they'll never know. Yeah. Um, you know, her, her 15-year-old cousin disappeared a year after she died and we still haven't found him. And he's, he could be on this wall as one of these unidentified um, tags or he could just have disappeared in the desert, be eaten by vultures, completely destroyed, and, and we'll, never, we'll never find any of his remains. The process of amplifying the sorrow of one human passing in this circumstance to 3,200 of them that have been the ones that have been identified, um, 2,000 identified, 1,200 not, just only that you're aware of yeah. um, on just one-fourth of the yeah. order. Um, this is quite a heavy feeling um, so there's there's more family members there's more ambitions that are unfulfilled family members that gain trauma sure. um, there's ones that have never been, never identified and viewing it that way tells the story that do we really want to inflict that much more suffering yeah. do we want to know what could have been unleashed from their ambitions. No. Yeah, it's a, I mean, and it keeps happening. It's happening right now. You know, this has been going on for 20 years and it doesn't seem like it's gonna stop anytime soon, unfortunately. So this is experiential, immersive art that is also contemporary archaeology. And I believe we talked about this a little bit last time, but this style of portraying the information uh, has a profound impact for those that are willing to slow down mm. and look at the tags sure, sure. and aim to really immerse themselves in a human's reasons for going across them. Well, flying. and the, the goal of this project, I mean, it is, it's participatory. So these tags on this wall were filled out by about 500 volunteers at the University of Pennsylvania um, several months ago. And so with every exhibition that we're doing in 150 locations on five continents next year, we send them the kits with the basics and the information, and then they have to mobilize their communities to fill out the toe tags. And so for us, the most important aspect of the, of the, of the whole thing is the filling out of the tags and that kind of moment of solidarity with, with migrants and then, and then mounting it on the wall. So that, that's for us is a, you know so it's not just coming and looking at the toe tags yes. but it's but it's what does it mean to write down someone's name okay. and, and the date they were found and the condition they were found in is that a way to raise our awareness and, and yes. to connect us more to that issue? The answer is absolutely oh. yeah. Wow. So um, hundred and fifty locations yep. across five continents. Yeah, we're hoping in to break. We're, we're hoping to break Asia. So we haven't gotten to Asia yet, but we're in every we're on five continents right now. You heard that, let's get into Asia. That's yeah. huge, yeah. So we wanna get this into Asia. We want to uh, help be able to fund. You have a funding team now. Yep, and, yep. And this is great actually to see your team here um, helping you um, get the right uh, resources together to make, th you have to make these kits. Yeah. And the kits, uh, like you said, are extremely special because they have the, um, the 2,000 identified tags and the 1,200 unidentified tags, but they're blank. Yeah. And then the community has to assemble a team yeah. that then goes through the process of writing these. Yeah. And then that immerses you in the experience of creating a tag to represent a human. Yeah. That's that plus uh, the immersive experiential yeah. side of it are really great components to increase the awareness, yeah. I mean, and we hope that, you know, by writing out these names of the dead, 
it's in some way bringing them kind of back to life, you know, breathing life into this, into this, these toe tags for, yeah. just for a brief moment. And so to remind folks that, you know, they're not forgotten, even if they're unidentified, we're still at least recognizing that that is a person. And, um, you know, that's a, that's, that's real crucial for us, um, to just, and, and connect it with as many communities as possible. So we're all over the United States, Latin America, uh, Europe, Australia, um, Africa, and we're trying to connect with different communities that have been impacted with, by migration. So we have a heavy presence in Mexico, in Central America, but also in the Mediterranean. So we'll, we'll, bring, we'll bring this to places like Lampedusa, we'll bring this to Morocco, we'll bring this to, to Athens, and work with communities there, especially refugee and migrant communities, yeah. to help us build these, these exhibitions and, this, and to show some solidarity. So we're doing, we do a lot of outreach with different communities and then trying to connect, the, trying to show that the U.S.-Mexico border is not happening in isolation, right? We're having a global migration crisis and this is just one of many crises that are happening right now. And can we, can we bring awareness there, but then also increase our awareness about what's going on in these other places as well at the same time? A global migration crisis that's happening with uh, an unnecessary amount of suffering and death and that by getting other people to more deeply immerse themselves in the emotions of the crises across the planet, then it increases our awareness around it and desire to make solutions as soon as possible. Yeah. Jason, this is ridiculously heavy, um, but it's also um, the exact uh, amount of uh, awakening Mm -hmm. um, that needs to happen. This is the style of severe, kind of like yeah. shaky style awakening. Sure, for sure, sure. That, yeah. Does that kind of ring? A, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's 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 not subtle. No. You know, and I think we don't live in a moment where subtlety is working. And so yeah. this is like, look at it, recognize that there's a crisis going on, um, and then ask yourself, what am I going to do about this? You know, how am I going to make this better? Uh, do I care? And so when someone next to me hears someone say something bad about a migrant or about the U.S.-Mexico border, what's the image that you're going to have in your mind? Is it going to be, you know, um, this uh, anti-immigrant kind of headline in a newspaper, or is it going to be this? This, you know? exactly. So that, that's, the, that's, the, that's the hope. Because so. when you are in that situation and you're able to pull this out and properly explain this, uh, mm -hmm. it actually has the potential to change the other person's worldview for the better. Yeah. Yeah. We hope. Yeah. And this is also a great idea for other areas of conflict on borders sure. um, around the world. If, if, if those that are watching have border conflicts happening, they themselves can make similar sure. exhibitions. Sure. Sure. And, it, and it's designed to be, you know, relatively affordable. So it's only, it's fifteen hundred dollars for the whole kit. For the whole kit. Yeah. And so, and if people can't afford to do it, we'll subsidize it. So, um, you know, we're, we're just trying to make this as accessible as possible. So, like all of our Latin American shows are subsidized. All of our Africa shows are subsidized. But it's just if someone is interested and wants to bring this to their community, wants to connect it with issues that are relevant to their community in terms of immigration, border security, you know, we're we're, we're more than happy to, to partner with them. So people should get in touch. I mean, you can go to our, we have our website, hostileterrain94.org. They can get tons of information there. They can drop us an email if they're interested in learning about be becoming a host or in getting, getting involved in this in, in different places. So, I mean, we've, you know, we're at 130 confirmed locations right now. We anticipate that we'll hit 150 by the end of the year. Um, so people can look at the map and go, you know, where in my community is this happening? Is, is, it, is it nearby? And for a lot of people, it really, it will be. So that's the goal. We're gonna push this out starting in May. And it'll run all the way until until um, November second. From May till November second of twenty twenty. Twenty twenty, yeah. So it sort of staggers. It's like we have open, we have show opens, we have shows opening in May, and then we have some summer stuff, and then late fall is uh, or, or early fall is a lot of Europe, and then all of the U.S. shows launch. Um, you know, Latin America happens kind of in the summer, and then all of the European shows, um, and then and then the U.S. stuff happens between late August and, and late late October. And then the final version of this will be um, at the Corcoran Museum in Washington, D.C., where we'll build this wall, but we'll use tags that have been filled up by people from 150 locations around the globe. And so you'll be able to go and see this and, and see this thing that's been built by literally thousands of people. Yeah. yeah. And, and we estimate that um, 
that we could have 60,000 people filling out toe tags as part of the 150 shows. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, it's, 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 it's gaining steam. It's been really, um, yes. been really humbling to see all the support that we've gotten. Yes. That's uh, a massive awakening for the 60,000 people that will mm -hmm. be filling these out, plus the hopefully 100,000 plus people yeah. that will be viewing it. Um, and the data is there, which is another very interesting thing that, um, that we need to uh, be archaeologists, be contemporary archaeologists about is finding the data for California, New Mexico, Texas, sure. making similar displays across other border conflicts around the world. Can we identify the humans and the reasons why mm -hmm. and the trauma that's been inflicted mm -hmm. on their families? And can we m build a social fabric that does not have that happening anymore? We can, the answer is yes, but galvanizing the awareness to do so requires movements like this. I need to ask this question, how do you yourself stay emotionally resilient given the stories that you were just yeah. explaining to us? You know, I think I have a good team. I work with a lot of students and other collaborators who were all really supportive of one another. Um, we do a lot of talk therapy. We, we sort of work these issues out. I mean, this is not easy for us. And, Absolutely. And, and I was telling someone earlier today, every time I fill out a toe tag, you know, I respond in a different way. And sometimes it's in a really kind of heavy way. Like, you know, it, it, I can just find myself breaking down in the middle of it and just be totally surprised by that reaction. Like, I would think that after so much time around this that I would be desensitized, but it's actually the complete, the complete opposite. Um, so we're just, we're, we just try to take care of ourselves, you know, do a lot of self-care. Um, and then also remind ourselves too that that I'm very privileged to be able to raise awareness about this issue. And so, as as horrible it is for me to be involved in this stuff and to see this trauma over and over again, um, it's not as bad as what's happened to these folks. And so that kind of keeps me grounded um, in, in terms of recognizing my, my, my privilege in this space, um, and in, but also really inspiring me to say, if I don't do this, then, then who is? And so I, you know, the, the the lives that we're trying to raise awareness about. Um, I, I think really energize all of us as a, as a team. I messaged you this saying something similar where I previously hadn't made a really strong emotional understanding that this tag is representing a human of such complex existence. Yeah. yeah. And that's the style of response that we yeah. we want yeah. and um, this is uh, something that we deeply immerse our emotions into and perspective behind uh, and galvanize solutions to mm -hmm. and uh, again I'm just I'm really grateful that you and your team have been going with this much steam yeah. moving forward well thank you yeah. You're so awesome. We're, we're, we're going to keep keep it going. We got, uh, we've got 11 months to go till this thing is done. So, yeah, um, yeah. I actually feel like this has the um, this is the exact thing that shakes yeah. um, towards the solution, shakes the awareness towards the solutions, and then can hopefully shed light on all the other border conflicts and forced migrations, and sure. and can hopefully make more. Um, Wow, thank you for all of this. Thank you for all of this breakdown. And, um, and uh, our hearts are with the families um, and these spirits that are no longer here and that are um, sacrificed for, the, for us to build the next world that does not have these issues. Yeah, well, thank you. Thanks, Jason. Yep. Thanks for coming on oh the my program. No, oh, thank you. Always, thank always, you. A, always a pleasure. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. You are just, you guys are doing incredible work. Thanks, everyone, yep. for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. Um, we'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking. Please uh, support uh, hostileterrain94.org. Support the Undocumented Migration Project. Please support them. The links are in the bio below. You can follow Jason as well across his platforms. All those links are below. You can learn more about the project. You can get involved. You can donate to support the, to support the exhibitions that we're doing in underserved communities. Um, we have an online shop where you can buy, you can Christmas shop, you know, that, I mean, there's lots of things that we have that we're using to, um, um, 
to, to help support this project. So um, we've, we've got a pretty heavy um, <laughs> online presence. There's all of those different ways to get involved. Please reach out and get involved. Please, everyone, and support the American Anthropological Association as well. Um, it's really important to remember that we had only went through one of these examples and that if you amplify that example yeah. that many times, that gives you a deeper resonance with what this actually is. And you can support us too so we can continue doing great things like coming on site to incredible conferences like AAA to interview great leaders like Jason. Please help support us. You can find our links in the bio below. And go and build that future. Architect the social fabrics for more flourishing around the world, everyone. Thank you very much for tuning in. See you soon. Thank you. Thanks. Cool. Thank you. We'll hopefully see you in San Francisco. Uh, we're working on that. This is insane. Yeah. This is yeah. insanity. Yeah. This is absolute yeah. insanity. Yeah. The fact that we are doing this to. Yeah. It had, it had to happen. Yeah. It, it, had, it, had, it had to happen to awaken us. We wouldn't awaken yeah. if this isn't 